going to open this up with a little bit about who you are. Can you tell us about yourself, some of your hobbies, interests, and your position as well? Sure. Hello, I'm Chaney Mosley. I'm an assistant professor of agricultural education at Middle Tennessee State University, which is roughly uh, 30 miles outside of Nashville, Tennessee. I am a Tennessee native and uh, MTSU is my alma mater as well. That's where I went for undergrad. Hobbies, I, I enjoy being outside. As a family, we camp quite a bit. I've got three boys and a dog, um, but I also enjoy running, so uh, uh, I run just about every morning and go to the gym. Uh, we we like to build campfires and things like that, and I also enjoy reading, so a few hobbies. We're, uh, we enjoy music. We go to a lot of concerts and things like that as well. Very cool, and when you go on your morning runs, how often do you run for? Do you try to hit a certain mileage? I'm a runner as well. I went okay. to California States this year, which for cross country, which is pretty cool. It's just Congratulations, really fun. That, that's exciting, yeah. Yeah, so um, I will tell you that this year, so I've, I've been running for, I think I started running when I was 21? 21 or 22, so just over 20 years. Um, I was in college and did not run in high school or anything like that. Um, a, a friend sort of encouraged me to do it and I found that I really enjoyed it. But this year, my New Year's resolution was to run at least two miles outside every day, which doesn't sound like a heavy lift until it's winter or it's pouring down rain. Um, but I have, so far, I have met that goal this year. I've not missed a day of running outside. Um, I actually coached cross country when I was teaching high school. So I coached the cross country team as well. Um, but usually I, um, two miles is the minimum. And those are those days where I'm by myself and I don't have a group of folks to run with. And it's just, I'm doing it to get it done. Uh, usually three to four miles is what we go. Very cool. Do you see a half marathon or marathon in your future? I've completed um, a number of marathons, and so I think I don't see those in my future anymore. Um, I did a, a few tri um, Ironman triathlons as well, um, but those days are in the past. I it, Those were before I was married, before I had a family, and I find that the, the time required to train for those types of events um, takes time away from the family. So I'm good with just uh, running for recreation, running for my health, and those shorter distances I'm good with. I don't, I don't need any more medals or fin finishing <laughs> photos and stuff like that. Well, transitioning from your hobbies and interests, I'd like to speak about another interest of yours, which is education. So what sparked your interest in education to begin with? Yeah, so I grew up in a very rural town. The school that I attended was and still is kindergarten through 12th grade in the same school, public school. Uh, there were 32 people in my graduating class, so quite small. Um, and I, I grew up in a rural area. So when, when completing high school, I took agriculture coursework for all four years and found an interest in agriculture. When I went to MTSU, my major was agriculture business, but I wanted to get a teaching license so that I could teach as well. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the aspect of, of, teach, of learning about agriculture and the career and technical student organization, the Future Farmers of America is, it, it, it um, that many, many call it that. It's, uh, the name is actually just the National FFA Organization. It's it's since changed, but originally was the Future Farmers of America. And it was fun. It's uh, It sort of sustained my livelihood when, while I was in high school, and uh, I wanted to stay connected to that organization. So that's what led me to teaching initially. Wow, that's amazing. And thank you for all the work that you do as a teacher for the next generation of students. So from your high school to MTSU, what brought you back to the university for teaching? Yeah, so the first couple, is, this is a, a long story, so I'll try to get this out as short as possible. The first two years oh, nice. out, of, out of college, um, I, I did teach high school um, and I had a middle school class in there. I, I was young. I started teaching at 22 and my students were 18, some were 19 years old. Uh, classroom management was not something that I had a hold of. Um, and so I think I was already thinking, hmm, maybe this is not my path. Um, my my second year of teaching was in 2001. And when the World Trade Center was hit, I decided that I needed to join the Army. And that's what I did. September 2001, I enlisted in the, the Army Reserve. So I took a few years off teaching. But during that time, I matured a lot and received some really high quality training um, and came back, I guess, uh, reinvigorated with a little more confidence to go into a classroom and, and, and I'll say command an audience of, of teenagers. 
And so I did. I went back into the classroom there and, and had five more years, of just outstanding teaching experiences. Um, most of those were in Georgia, actually. And I enjoyed it so much that I decided I want to go back to graduate school so I could get a PhD and train future agriculture teachers. So Virginia Tech for graduate school, got my PhD, moved back to Tennessee and took a job at the Department of Education here as a career and technical education consultant before transitioning to Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools as the career and technical education director. And I held that position for roughly five years and kind of got bored um, and transitioned into school-based administration. So I was a high school administrator for a couple of years. And that's when the, the position at MTSU, my alma mater, opened up. A few folks contacted me and asked if I was interested in, in coming back. And um, it, it had been on my radar as like, at some point, this might be a possibility, but the timing was right. So I took advantage of that opportunity and I will be starting my sixth year, which is wild. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I like the flexibility that I have in the in the role in the position. I'm still teaching, but um, I'm teaching adults, I guess. You know, um, the freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors in college, and some who are much much farther out of high school as well. I mean, it's it's a it's a different approach to teaching, but I still get connected with middle and high school students because of a lot of the outreach that I do, and and it's fun. Yeah, I enjoy it. Thank you for your service. I was wondering, can you speak to some of the biggest challenges and rewards that you faced at MTSU when you're teaching students or based on your experience in the Metro Nashville Public Schools and kind of what was that like for you? With my interview on doc with Dr. Cobb, she was speaking to kind of the really, really high level of concentration of students and a lot of them come from very underserved areas and communities. So what was your experience in that environment and what were some of the challenges and rewards that you got from all of the experiences that you've had there and at MTSU? Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. I'll try. I'll try to address all those. But yeah, Nicole Cobb was fantastic. We were colleagues there. Our offices were across the hall, and we collaborated on quite a few projects together. She, I'm making assumptions that she probably spoke to this as well. Um, equity and access. So in Nashville, inclusion and you know we talk about inclusion, access, equity, and diversity a lot, but inclusion and diversity was not something that we really had to concern ourselves with in an urban school district of that size because it, it, it the school system itself was very diverse both in terms of the teaching core the administration uh, employees at the central office the students that we served the families that we served you know spoke multiple languages come um, came from a variety of countries and, and racial and ethnic backgrounds and things like that um as, and there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of variance in socioeconomic status, and that's where the access and equity challenges um, I think came to fruition. Nicole and I, as well as some of our other incredible colleagues, um, we really worked hard for about five years to um, to close the the gap in terms of access to high quality learn teaching and learning experiences. And some of those things that the socioeconomic barriers are real. Um, so, um, you know, lack of access to to uh, for uh, lack of access to transportation to get to option schools. So maybe the magnet schools where students may have qualified for, but the school system didn't provide a, a bus there. So you had to provide that for yourself, right? Things like that. Um, and we we wrote a lot of grants. We incorporated a lot of projects, and we found one of the best ways to address issues related to equity was through was through building out a network of of uh, business and industry and nonprofit partners throughout the system to help support students not only in their their career exploration but also their post secondary exploration to help them experience careers to inform what they would do after high school now be that training be that earning a credential be that entering the military going into um, two or four year college things like that uh, but also giving the giving them a, a better idea of what a, what career opportunities could exist. So often youth are focused on what we see in the media, what we see on the news, and what we read about in books, farmers, doctors, lawyers. But there is a gamut of careers that students are rarely exposed to. And I think that was probably um, one of the things that I'm most proud of, of while we were at Metro. Um, one of the biggest accomplishments was expanding the partners that we offered and also um, creating a a framework and executing that framework for giving our students access to 
um, prepare and sit for industry credentialing exams and graduate high school with a credential that would give them a foot in the door for employment, immediate employment to either finance their way through college or um, or go into work full time. And, and so I think that's one of the ways that we try to address equity and access. It's really tough. It's a tough challenge. And um, now at, at the at the university level, MTSU is a, is a public university. It's a four year college. But I still see those issues of equity and, and access. Um, some of the more privileged the students with more privileged backgrounds um, come into my classes assuming that because because their classmates are all in college, that must mean that they have access to high speed Internet at home or that they have a personal laptop computer that they can that they can bring from class to class or that they have the time to to meet in the afternoons for group projects. Uh, but I, I try to kind of dispel some of those myths or those misunderstandings and um, and help them realize that not not all of us have the luxury of not having to work while we're in college. Many of my students work near full time jobs. Some of them do work full time jobs and things like that. So that continues to be a challenge. But um, you know, for things that I'm most proud of, again, it's it's working to address issues of um, of equity and access. From a, a professional perspective, I, I still serve the school system. I sit on advisory boards and work with teachers, provide professional development to help them address those things as well. As your work on the school boards and at MTSU, I was wondering if you could speak to the success rate. Have you seen that the kids that once you expose them to various outlets and avenues for career paths, maybe not all of them are choosing to go to a four-year university, are you seeing higher success rates of the kids that are listening to what's best for them versus what the media is telling them to do? Do they tend to succeed more over the kids that kind of are forced to go into a four-year university or maybe think that it's their only path? Well, what I can tell you is their national, uh, national level, high quality research shows that students who complete three or more years of career and technical education in a focused program of study have higher income earning than their non-career and technical education peers. So that's exciting. That's not, that's, uh, not anecdotal. That's what the research tells us. Um, and it's career and technical education or, you know, career-based learning, career education is very advantageous for, uh, for youth who, who need it most, which tends to be boys as well as um, youth from racial and ethnic minority um, minority groups. So I'm happy about that. What I can tell you anecdotally is that, I mean, you hit it. Students may get exposure to careers. They may have have had interactions with uh, with local employers who explain to them, if you want to be um, in this career field, this is the, the degree that you need. And they may opt out of going to college, and that's okay. I think the, the greatest benefit is they've hopefully developed um, some some technical skill set that is transferable to to whatever job or career field that they enter, as well as some uh, some we'll call them uh, people call them a lot of things. I refer to them as employability skills, specifically the ability to communicate orally in written form, um, to collaborate with others, think critically to solve problems, and just uh, and harnessing their creativity and the different approaches that they take. You know we. It's uh, we can give students skills that will set them up for success, but we, but only the, the individual student can determine when and how they use those to, and only, you know, as individuals, only we can determine our own levels of success. And that looks different for everyone. Right. That makes sense. And thank you for speaking on how there's different levels of success and that success comes from different types of career avenues for people. And sometimes people are more successful based on the best avenue that fits them. And maybe that's not so mainstream. You speak a lot about career and technical education. I'm a bit unfamiliar with the concept and I was wondering if you could speak to what it is and why do you focus so heavily on it? Sure. Um, career and technical education is, is uh, it's, it is a broad term. Nationally, there are 16 career clusters and um, they they span a gamut of career opportunities. But first, let's distinguish between a job and a career. A career has uh, the opportunity for multiple entry and exit points and upward mobility, whereas a job typically doesn't. A job tends to be something that is uh, temporary. It's for a moment. It's for a season. But it doesn't offer um, training so that you can advance 
personally, professionally move up. If that makes, does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Okay, so when we think about career and technical education, um, it's taking, um, it's exposing students to career opportunities across a variety of fields. So uh, many refer to it as vocational education. That is an outdated term, but let's let's take my parents. They went through vocational education courses, and um, this is often depicted in, in movies, especially from the 80s. So you might say a shop class or a sewing class or a home economics class or things like that. Uh, but they they have been rebranded and they um, and reformed as well. So I'll give an example. Um, legal professions is a career and technical education area. Healthcare is a career and technical education area. Engineering is a career and technical education area. But often folks don't think about that. So in Metro National Schools, we had students who were graduating high school, having had three or four years of engineering coursework and earning um, their certifi uh, certificate or certification in AutoCAD, right? Or we have students that would complete three to four years of healthcare coursework and would graduate high school with a certified nursing assistant or a certified pharmacy technician credential. So they're getting exposure and experience working in these fields, um, as well as getting access to early post-secondary opportunities that are aligned with those career paths. Um, students that were in the legal professions pathway, for example, might earn three college credits with uh, um, in, in related to law. Um, Agriculture is my field, so ag food and natural resources. But again, that itself, many think, oh, it's farming. Ah, it's so much more than farming, though. It incorporates biotechnology and engineering and robotics, as well as the animal sciences. Um, think of like veterinarians. Those are folks. But uh, that's so when I mentioned career tech ed, those are the types of things that I'm thinking of. But it's also I mean, I could go on and on. Hospitality and tourism, logistics, banking and finance, all of those things are career and tech ed. They tend to be elective courses in many states and in many, uh, many school systems um, across the country. That's very fascinating. And I want to speak to your main focus in agriculture. You mentioned biotechnology and robotics. To someone living in the Bay Area where there's not a lot of farmland around, I mean, we have kind of concrete jungles, but I was wondering if you could explain it a bit more about some of your favorite parts about the agricultural side of education. <laughs> First, let me say, um, the, the, regardless of location, everyone experiences it and is influenced by agriculture. So the clothes that we wear comes from the, the fiber that's that's uh, produced from from crops or from livestock. You know, if it's if you're wearing a wool sweater, that wool came from a mammal of some sort, a, an alpaca or a, a sheep or you know things like that. The food that we consume that's grown from producers, and we can say farmers, but some food is grown from those who don't identify as a farmer, but they are a producer. Maybe they work in an urban area. Maybe they have a um, a, um, a greenhouse that is vertical farming or, or things like that, but they're still agricultural producers. The structures in which we live, work, and, and go to school, right? The wood didn't come from uh, just a pier. It, it comes from the timber and the forestry industry. So we are all very wrapped up in, in, in the agriculture industry, but often we don't think about that. So that's the, the first thing I like to characterize. And um, there is a tremendous amount of agriculture that exists in urban locations. And, and it looks different. It looks different. But here in Nashville, for example, um, there's a greenhouse. It is Optimara, and it is the world's largest producer of African violets. But no one would expect that to be in agriculture. Now, African violet is an ornamental plant. But um, if you were to see this greenhouse that is amidst a neighborhood, it is massive. It's huge, right? So there's, there's an example there. But also transportation and logistics. We think of farm to table, and I guarantee in the Bay Area, a lot of that is happening. How are we getting the food from the producer to the consumer? And so the logistics is, is part of that as well. Um, I could go on and on and talk about agriculture all, all day, uh, but those are some of the ways that, that ag it kind of, it, it spans a variety of, of career fields as well. What do you think is the biggest challenge that the agricultural education is facing in this modern day? You were mentioned vertical farming. I know that there is kind of controversy on vertical farming. So in your opinion, what are some of those biggest challenges? Um, well, the biggest challenge facing agricultural education um, is actually the, the um, uh, a, it's the teacher shortage. 
Um, last year in Tennessee, for example, we began the, the school year with um, 18 high schools that could not find an agriculture teacher. I cannot produce enough certified teachers. There are five universities in Tennessee that have an agriculture teacher preparation program. We can't produce enough to, to meet the need, meet the demand. And that's a national, I won't say crisis, but it is a national ongoing challenge. Um, uh, how do we put enough uh, teachers in classrooms to teach that? But it's not only in ag, right? That's in math, that's in science, it's in engineering, it's in uh, just about special education, just about every field of education has a teacher shortage. So from an ag ed perspective, that's the biggest challenge. From a production agriculture or the agriculture industry in general, I think one of the largest challenges is access to a qualified as a skilled workforce that is sustainable. A lot of that goes can go. I can attribute that to a variety of things, um, but uh, hmm, we really need a fair and balanced immigration policy. And unfortunately, immigration is something that has become so politicized I mean, it becomes part of the culture wars but it is really difficult because um, those who are operating uh, farms on large scale producing both livestock and and crops they need access to workers and to be frank there are not a, a lot of uh, American citizens who are here that are willing to do that work and so we 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 need um, immigrants who are willing to do that work um, and so that becomes a challenge. Uh, there is also a challenge and and um that i that i'm a bit more closely tied to the the stress that that i would say the stress that farmers experience in their professional and personal lives um is tends to be different from other careers um and because that we have a high rate of mental illness and a very high rate of suicide that occurs in the agriculture industry as well that's fascinating and thank you for touching on the many different levels of complexity to those challenges. This is a broader question, but what is it like working in your field? You've mentioned a bit about collaboration. Are you always collaborating? Is it more of kind of a solo thing on certain projects and then other projects it's big collaboration? I, I, first, I like the, I, I, the probably the unintentional pun. What is it like to work in my field? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an ag joke there for you. No, I collaborate a lot. Um, I'll give you an example of a current project. Uh, it's a federally funded project from the United States Department of Agriculture. Colleagues and I are working on a, a sustainable food system project that begins with the soil. So, so, if, soil if, the, if soil is not healthy, then the yield will be low. If soil is not healthy um, and the yield is low, then there's less feed for livestock, things like that. So everything begins with soil. So capturing, thinking about that in the context of a dairy food system, we are um, growing corn for livestock feed um, and different types of, of soil with it's receiving different types of treatment. We're taking the, the corn, we are harvesting the corn and then turning it into silage for dairy cattle. We are feeding that corn to dairy cattle and collecting the milk from, from different uh, experimental groups. We are evaluating the quality of the milk um, in terms of the, the, the nutritional value. Then we are taking that milk and doing um, sensory analysis with consumer panels. It, the, different, the milk tastes different depending on what the cattle eat. In addition, we're turning that into dairy products. So think cheese, think yogurt, and we will evaluate the nutritional profiles of, of those dairy products and as well as doing sensory analysis once we have that information about the nutritional profiles of the milk, of the of the soil, the feed, the, the milk, the milk products, we will then run an economic analysis to determine if a farmer can um, can receive a um, a higher profit margin on uh, on a, an agricultural commodity, in this case, dairy products, be it milk or food products, um, because of the way that the soil was managed from the very beginning. So the, that's an example that it requires working with food scientists, soil scientists, animal scientists, agricultural economists, and then I'm sort of just like in the middle of all of it. <laughs> Thank you for explaining this project. I think it's a great opportunity to show people just how intricate and just how many opportunities there are in the field of agriculture because you need so many people working on it. This is a question more directed to the project, but how do you determine the best quality of soil? Is there a certain feel to the soil or is there certain areas of the United States that in your opinion produce the best soil? 
Um, it's not necessarily about producing the best soil, but soil has uh, has different characteristics, right? So you've got nitrogen that's in the soil, you've got carbon that's in the soil, you have a pH level, and it depends on the type of plant that you're trying to grow. Um, Tennessee is, 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 I would argue Tennessee has one of the best climates um, in, in the United States, just given the climate that we have. So we have an extended growing season that some don't have access to. It doesn't get as hot here as it does in some locations and it doesn't get as cold. So we're very lucky in Tennessee to have that climate, but how we manage the soil um, can change things. So I'll give an example. I have a student right now who is, um, he's interested in sustainable uh, sustainable crop production. So he's engaged in a research project. Um, he re re was just reading a lot about like backyard gardening and what are people doing to, to be, um, uh, to, to be kind and gentle to the soil using natural products to as soil amendments and things like that. Um, so, uh, so he, we made three different, uh, we made three different types of soil. You can make soil. And um, some of the things that he used, he used hay, he used coconut fiber, he used um, peat moss and perlite. And all of these different things come with their own, um, with, their, with their own characteristics. So um, some might may make the soil more acidic, which would be great for blueberries, but he's not growing blueberries. It, um, he's growing uh, turnips, right? So he has three different plots. So one with just the soil that he created, one with the soil that he created, but he also combined in over the course of six months, uh, red wigglers, it's, it's a worm. Um, and to as they work through the soil, they also create worm castings, which should sort of essentially fertilize the soil in a natural way. And then in the third research, uh, research plot of soil, he added cattle manure from cattle. Uh, and so his thought was a lot of people are throwing red wigglers into their raised garden beds. You probably have a lot of this in the Bay Area, people in gardening, maybe yes. growing a tomato plant or, or a variety of things, right? And and so, you know, making some predictions. And he said, well, I keep reading a lot about this. I think um, we built a soil, but I think that the soil that that has, um, has the cattle manure mixed in with it is probably going to produce the strongest plant. Um, and he's right, we can visibly tell, um, but he didn't expect it to grow at such a higher rate. And this goes back to your question about soil. The reason that that's growing um, at, a, at a higher rate, it will produce a much stronger root, the turnip, um, and probably longer root roots that go deeper and um, and there will be more weight of that, um, of that final crop is because of the nitrogen, nitrogen that is found in the manure that you're not going to get from worm castings and maybe in, in smaller doses. And so that's an example of a soil management approach by adding nitrogen. But if you're driving around and you see uh, two homes that are side by side and they both have the same type of grass that is planted and one grass is not very green and the other is, it's likely because they've applied nitrogen or someone has applied nitrogen to that grass to give it that more green, healthy look. This is fascinating. As someone who's very interested in science, to me, it's almost like curiosity was the catalyst for this amazing kind of reaction with all of this work on his research project with soil. I wanted to know, how has your work personally impacted you? Um, when I started it, gosh, a variety of ways. I mean, first off, I'm training future teachers. And um, I, because I've been doing this for five years now, students who were freshmen when I started started are now in their second and third year, some in their fourth year of teaching high school. And that's really neat, right? Um, being a part of that, it's, I guess it's it's not a direct impact, it, it, but it it increases the indirect impact that I have on hopefully the, the future workforce of the agriculture industry. Um, so that's exciting. But, you know, in, in my field as an academic, we are charged with teaching, but also conducting research and also providing service or engaging in outreach. And in 2018, the governor of Tennessee um, assembled a, uh, a Tennessee farmer suicide, I think it was the Tennessee Farmer Suicide Task Force. And each university with an agriculture program was asked to nominate one person to serve on that task force. Um, I, I raised my hand. Um, without going into too, too many details, um, as an administrator, I experienced suicide with, with, um, with high school students. Um, and... Uh, just some other personal exposure to mental mental health and you know, friends, family, things like that. So it was a topic that I was I was interested in. Admittedly, I wasn't as familiar with with the impact of, of, of mental health in the ag industry until I joined that task force. 
that led to collaborations across a variety of universities where um, we where I engage now in high quality research about suicide awareness and suicide prevention in the agriculture industry. So that's sort of my my pet project right now or my passion project. I think that it will probably define much of, of what I continue researching for the rest of my career. Um, and we've, we've unearthed, I'll share just some really interesting things. My focus is on agriculture teachers, right? Um, because in agriculture programs, teachers are often farmers. Um, I operated a 30 by 90 foot greenhouse when I was teaching high school. We had, we produced fall uh, plants in the fall, plants in the spring. Um, but many schools have, have livestock facilities where they're raising sheep or they're raising cattle or they're raising hogs. Um, and, and those are some schools, depending on where they are, may have orchards that they are operating. So a lot of agriculture teachers are farmers and they're teaching their other students how to produce uh, food, fiber, timber, things like that. Because of that, um, I, I focused on farmers for my research, I'm sorry, on agriculture teachers, middle and high school agriculture teachers for my research, and discovered that female agriculture teachers are um, tend to be more aware of suicide warning signs. Um, female agriculture teachers are more willing to participate in professional development, um, as well as those teachers with less experience. Um, and those are just a few of the findings that we had. There were some that, that go a little bit deeper, but we had 10 uh, significant findings from that that will shape future directions for how we train and prepare teachers and how we equip teachers to recognize suicide warning signs and also intervene. So uh, taking advantage of some of that knowledge around suicide prevention, not only with their students and with staff in their school, but also in the communities that they serve. So um, I'm really excited because I think that is the work that will that is sustainable and will carry on beyond my, hopefully beyond my lifetime. That's amazing. And in regards to your research and all of the extensive research that you have been doing and you will continue to do, what is the writing process like for you? I like to write. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I do. Um, I really enjoy writing. And, and I think I wrote before graduate school, but I did. I wrote more for, for fun. Um, and I didn't write technical technically. I get I didn't produce technical reports or things like that. So there's a little bit of a learning curve learning how to write. Um, and in our industry, the, um, APA is the format for some. It's MLA, but APA formatting is what we write in, and I enjoy it. I like to write for the consumption of of, of readers who are not academics. So taking research and writing about it in ways that's more consumable. Um, that's a that's a big challenge because I also have to write for academic journals, right? So that I can get the research published by the nerds like me who want to know about the statistics. Um, so it, it's time consuming. It really is because you have to do a lot of background research first, but I enjoy it. I am the same way. I really enjoy writing. I think that sometimes my love of writing kind of is translated to as these long paragraphs with all this intricate research or thinking that I've done. But I can really understand it's really a challenge sometimes to condense it and to put it in a way that's more manageable for everyone. But I'm the same way. The writing process is a lot of work, but a lot of fun. How long does it take you for how long does it take for you to get your work published? Um, it depends on the journal to which I'm submitting. So I, that's the, let's just say by the time, if I have an article finished, what I think is finished, it's never finished because um, the editors or the review panel always comes back with recommended changes. But um, let's say a good time frame would be if I submit it uh, today, then I would hope to have heard something within within six months, either a letter of rejection or acceptance with these edits, things like that. Some are, sometimes it's faster, right? You can get some turn, can turn that around in two to three months, but six six months is pretty average for me. And how are these research projects created? Is there a journal that reaches out to you and says, we want you to create this? Or do you come up with an idea with your fellow colleagues and then do you submit it to a research journal? Yeah, it's, it starts with the generation of an idea for a research project, <clears throat> but not just an idea. There are a lot of things that I think would be uh, that I would be curious about re re researching, but there has to be a problem identified first, right? You can't. Sure, we can go research things, but if if it's not for a purpose, if we're not trying to address or solve a problem or fill a gap in the literature, then it's kind of time wasted. So we spend our time identifying problems and then thinking, okay, there's a gap in the liter the literature here, or there's this problem here, suicide in the agriculture industry, for example. How can we solve it? So I'll I'll use that as an example. 
Well, we have agriculture teachers who are working with younger people, but agri stigma about around mental health, especially in rural areas, especially with, with men in rural areas is very high. So if we can work to break down the stigma among youth in 20 years from now, those men, uh, those youth who will be men may not stigmatize mental health um, in similar ways. So let's create a sustainable model. But before we can do that, we're making a lot of assumptions. We have to test our assumptions with agriculture teachers in the in the first place and also discover what they know and what their gaps in knowledge about suicide and suicide prevention are so that we can create tailored professional development that meets their needs. And then hopefully they're able to deliver that um, to, to their students as well. In regards to the work that you do, especially with suicide prevention, what advice would you have for people that are interested in this field and how they can best make an impact? Yeah, I think the best the advice, my initial advice is educate yourself, right? We can't, um, we, we can't intervene, we can't prevent suicide if we don't know what to look for, what those warning signs might be. So I believe in, I believe they're headquartered in Washington is the QPR Institute. QPR stands for Question, Persuade, Refer. It's a training. It doesn't take long. Uh, you can be trained within an hour. And the training focuses on helping participants recognize warning signs and then um, learn how to ask people if they are having thoughts about killing themselves. It's a very direct approach. It also just um, sort of addresses some of the myths about suicide, and I think that's very helpful. Um, and then the, the persuade is persuading someone to, to get help and then knowing where to refer these folks to get help. So I think that's one of the easiest, fastest ways that we can engage in preventing suicide. But again, if we don't know what to look for and where to go for help, then that's that's a really difficult task to do. Um, but for those watching, um, even if they're not trained, if they suspect that someone is in a mental health crisis or maybe having thoughts of suicide, the most important thing that we can do is ask a very direct question. Are you thinking about harming yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? And if so, offer hope because those in crisis have lost all hope. And so um, offering hope is the, is one of the best things we can do when we identify someone in crisis. Thank you for addressing the viewers and thank you for commenting on the best way for us as youth, especially to get involved as we live in a highly digitized world and where people are easily kind of going down a rabbit hole of thinking about I'm isolated and alone. In regards to ways to combat that, I wanted to ask you kind of about your favorite activities. Oftentimes activities and getting outside and being with other people are the best ways for people to connect with one another and to not feel so alone. So what are some of your, your favorite things to do with, with your family, uh, with your friends as well? Yeah, we've started this with the boys uh, recently in the evening. So we're lucky we live in a neighborhood that is that is safe to walk in. But we'll, I'll ask the boys, do you, do you want to go for a stroll? Which just means we're going to walk around the neighborhood. We're going to wave at the neighbors. We may stop and pet a dog, things like that. Um, we I just find that that's get, getting out and moving. It also allows us an opportunity to have conversations with our kids when we are not focused on our work, when we're not looking at our phones, when they are not asking to watch TV. So we are right there with each other and, and that's very helpful. Um, you know, I mentioned I run, but I have a group of folks that I run with. I don't like running alone. And we use our that common time that we have together to air our grievances in our personal professional lives but also um, bounce ideas off of one another. And uh, a buddy was was really um, not stressed, but concerned. He's a real estate agent that he might not close on a house or they hadn't gotten an offer. And then that night, he's like, thanks for listening to me. I don't know what happened, but but the house is now under contract. And that's that's a big win. And I said, yeah, that's that's the purpose of our runs. So we that we have this space where we can do things like that. I absolutely love that. That's how I feel with running. And I try to get my friends to go. Uh, some of them don't want to go. They would rather go on one of those strolls. But yeah. it's oftentimes a great place to think of things and just to let your mind flow and to enjoy beautiful scenery. I think that I'm really close to a lot of trails and forests, so it's it's always nice to spend that time outside. Yeah. So I want to transition to kind of, I like to end with some fun questions. And I ask this question to everyone. But if you were an ice cream flavor, what flavor would you be? That's tough. Um, I'm sure everyone says that. Neapolitan, I don't know if that's even a flavor, but it's that combo of strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, because it has something for everyone. 
So, you know, you pull that out. If someone doesn't like vanilla, that's fine. You've had, you have two other flavors. So hope that's, I guess that's my answer there. That's, that's a very practical one. And I have not heard that one. And I really, I really like that one. And that's one of my favorite flavors. Do you have any pets? I remember you did say you have a dog. What kind of dog do you have? We do. We have a Boston Terrier, Duke. He's an old man. He's maybe 14. So he was a rescue pup years ago. Um, but in addition, we have three hermit crabs. So <laughs> they are very interesting. They're interesting creatures. The boys do a, a great job of, of taking care of them. But also, you know, they're learning a lot just from, uh, from animal husbandry or the responsibility that comes with taking care of, a, of a, their own small pets. So this is our putting our toe in the water with giving them their own pet and seeing how they do with that. Well, hermit crabs are a good choice. I have Never had hermit crabs before, but I have a very close aunt of mine who owned turtles. And I think having those kind of niche cool pets are always yeah. fun because it's a great docking point for people. If you could travel to any place in the world, where would you go to and why? That's a tough one. Um, you know, I want to say somewhere that I haven't been, but I, I got to tell you, like, I've been to some incredible places that I would visit again in the heartbeat. Um, right now, Australia, I've, I've been before, but I, I stayed in and around Sydney. I would like to go back to Australia and experience um, uh, other parts of the country. I'd like to go up to the Great Barrier Reef. I didn't get to see that. I would like to go over to Perth. Uh, there are just a lot of opportunities in Australia, and I would like to take advantage of that. Uh, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. On your first trip to Australia, how long were you there for, and what was your favorite part of that trip? I think I was there for about a week. Maybe it was it was about 10, 10, 11 years ago. It was 2012, I believe. My favorite part was reconnecting with folks. So years ago, when I was an undergrad, I worked on a ranch in California in, um, in Sonoma County, so not too far from, from the Bay. And um, at, at that ranch, we had international staff that would come work this summer. So I made some, some friends that were from Australia as well. So getting to reconnect with those Friends was really neat, but also experiencing a different culture. Um, and, you know, we, yes, we we speak the same language, but the terminology is vastly different. Um, learning about the, the climate that is there. Um, I, can't, I got sunburned on day one, and, and so I know a little bit better now. But also, like, I ate a kangaroo burger, right? So kangaroo meat is not something that we have here in, in, in the States. But getting to, to taste that over there was quite neat. That's really cool. I hope to go to Australia someday as well. I think that, like you were mentioning, the Great Barrier Reef and just seeing all of the cool cultures there and maybe even trying a kangaroo burger. Do you yeah. have a favorite movie? If so, why is it your favorite movie? I do. It's an older movie. I doubt you've seen it, but the movie is Stand By Me. I, I love a good coming of age story and um, it, it resonates with me for a few reasons, but I saw it probably when I was, I think I first saw it when I was in sixth or seventh grade. And the main characters are transitioning from eighth grade to ninth grade or junior high to high school. There is, there is a career and technical education focus in there as well. At the very end, they're talking about this kid went, went on because he was going to college and this kid took the shop classes in high school. And, but it really characterizes the, just the best part of youth and of childhood are, are the summers and the exploring and what, what you do and you discover about yourself and about the world through those friendships that you have that are hopefully sustained and sometimes they're not. Stand by me, the narrator sort of like hits you with a, with a dose of reality. It's like a slap in the face that, that, that uh, you're an adolescent, but as you grow up, as you become an adult, things happen. Your friendships grow apart. Um, someone dies at a very early age. Someone gets married and starts a family. And um, and that that's the reality of life. But uh, but I think it really characterizes the essence and the, and the value of, of youth um, and being able to be carefree without, yeah, you may have responsibilities, chores at home, but without the worries and the pressures of, of being an adult. I, I love a good coming of age story. That's amazing. And I hope to watch this movie because you made it sound really cool. And I have not seen this movie. So another one um, to my list. And ending off our interview, thank you again very much for your time. Do you have a favorite book? If so, why? I have a uh, I have a favorite author. I have a few favorite authors, but um and, and so I, it's really hard for me to pick a favorite book. So we'll just, um, we'll go with uh, John Krakauer. So he writes creative nonfiction. Um, a few examples, a, a few titles, um, Into the Wild, which became a movie. Um, I, 
I, I would also like reading the book before seeing the movie. I did the same with Harry Potter. Um, Into the Wild, uh, Under the Banner of Heaven, Into Thin Air. He has a really, uh, really creative voice. And it's factual information, the creative nonfiction. But he adds, uh, adds a style that really draws you in. Um, and I find everything that he, that he writes to be an enjoyable read. So we'll just we'll say anything by John Krakauer. That's perfect. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for doing this interview with me. Yeah, I appreciate you reaching out. Mm -hmm.